Today we'll be reading from the book of Daniel, from the second chapter, and verse 24. Daniel 2, 24. We'll be reading from the New King James Version, with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king, and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah, who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the later days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, 
The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering in incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he said, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Amen. God has decided to help the exiled people and captive people there where they are with every blessing since he has promised. And all the promises of God are true. Whatever promise can, that is given by God to any man, then God has taken the obligation in his hands to fulfill it just as long as the man stands and remains in the will of God and he walks exactly as God wants him to. This trial is not for the disaster and the destruction of the people of Israel. And the trial that God brings in our lives, it's not for evil in man's life. Many times God permits difficulties in our lives. But I usually say, and I believe this, dear brethren, that God does always the least from what He can do just as long if, if He gets His goal, which is to bring man into blessing, but especially in eternal life. It's not only that God does not place greater burden than what man can lift for the blessing of man, it's not only that, but also God does always whatever is possible, the least, the smallest affliction on man, but the necessary affliction so that man may walk exactly as God wants him to. And he doesn't consider anyone. God doesn't show partiality. What he cares about is because he loves men, he wants them to reach the end, the kingdom of heaven. He wants them to take part in the rapture of the church in the end. This is his attempt. And it really amazes me every time when I read it that even to Paul, this man, this blessed man, servant, apostle Paul, God did not spare him, but he sent a messenger of Satan to buffet him that he won't be exalted above measure and lose the kingdom of heaven because it was necessary he be given abundance of revelations so the gospel of Jesus Christ can come even to our days. The trial that God permits has a purpose. Our training, first of all. God wants to train man to make him more reliable, more approved. For that reason, the Word of God admits that sorrow that comes from trial works for patience, patience brings approval, but approval also gives to man hope, and whoever hopes on God will not be put to shame. Hope will not put you to shame. Of course, it is a lot better today to ask from God to give us so we can have our hope in God and only in God, so it won't be necessary for us to go through all this procedure of sorrow. Indeed, when we lose our, our hope easily, we must know that the consequence, because we must have our hope in God and only in God. In other words, when we easily fall, when we are easily disappointed, when easily we lose our, not only our hope, but also our trust in God, then we must know that God must work for hope in our heart. And he will start again with sorrows. Sorrow will work for patience. Patience will work for approval because it is necessary for him to create a man, a servant, a maidservant, and manservant 
who will hope in God in the end, and only God, on one hand, so they will not be put to shame, because God doesn't want us to be put to shame before the devil and the world. On one hand, he doesn't want them to be in shame. On another hand, he wants them to be reliable cooperatives in the work of God. And we want to do the work of God. And the more we want to work for God, the more does God want to increase our hope toward Him. It is a purpose, a final purpose of God. And may it be our purpose also. It is not the purpose of God for you to be with power of faith. This is a grace by God. God gives this. But hope is something that is our own responsibility also. We must hope in God. We must not be disappointed. We must not say, it's over. God doesn't care about me. You must know also that when you think like that, sorrow comes before you. There's no other way. But when, dear brethren, we strive, we work for our hope, then we will be, in the immediate future, the example, the blessed example of the blessed man. Blessed is the man who hopes on the Lord and whose hope is God. It is a short and sure way to enjoy always the blessing of God in our life. Sure and short. Let us not neglect this. Let us not neglect to work and reject our despair from our life to work for hope in our life. Do not lose your hope. Why should God start again from the beginning in your life with sorrows? And when you lose your, ho your hope, then you must turn your eyes up to heaven and say, Lord, I hope only in you. Besides, our hope is not so difficult. It's not such a difficult matter that needs devotion, needs power. It's not that difficult. It's a simple thought. Lord, don't you love me? It's not possible for you to leave me. And David has this nice characteristic, my dear brethren. I read it today and I saw this. He fell, he sinned, he had many things. But you know what he never lost in his life? His hope in God. He fell, he sinned, he had many enemies. But he said, I cried out to God and my hope is in you. I've never read anything. There may be something. I'm just saying this superficially today. But I never have read about Daniel saying that he lost his hope. And indeed, when he came to the point of there not be help from anyone, he said, I turn my eyes up to the heavens. I see no one coming to help me. From where will my help come? And he doesn't say from nowhere, but he sees nothing around him. He says, my help will come from heaven. Hallelujah. This is his hope. And if I do not see any light in front of me, God will be my light. And in the valley of the shadow of death, if I walk, I will fear no evil, because you will be with me. This is hope. And it's a nice message, dear brethren, for us today. To never lose our hope. And when we see that our hope is lost, then we must struggle and say, No, God forbid. No. Can God not help? Does God not want to help? Since I have devoted my life to God, will God be ignorant of me? Will He ignore you, my brother? Is it ever possible for God to ignore you? Only if you say there is no God, then things change. But look around you. Who regenerated you? Who baptized you in the Holy Spirit? Who made this church? Hallelujah. Can we say that there is no God? If there is a God, there is hope. Hallelujah. If there is God, there cannot not be hope. And if we do not see easily with our eyes, it's because a cloud has entered between us. Now, because there's a cloud doesn't mean that there's no sun. But it's raining. Yes, the rain will pass. It's raining and raining and raining and raining, but the Word of God says that a flood will never come again. So, as much as it may rain, the sun will come out again. Amen, brethren. 
But I do not want to tell you only not to lose your hope. It is a different matter what God told me to say. And forgive me for saying it like this. Don't abandon, don't forsake your hope because you start from sorrow again. Why should I start from sorrow? I want to start and end with hope. Amen, brethren. And it's not difficult to say, I have lost my hope. Just barely when this thought enters your heart, say, no, no, get out. God is alive. He is risen. He loves me. I have no doubt about this. I, dear brethren, doubt about everything. About all of you, about everything about me, I doubt. But one thing I do not doubt, that Christ loves me. Christ loves me. It's over. It's proven. It has been proven. I am, uh, he has drawn me on his palms. He has me in his hands. And if I slip, if I stumble, if I make mistakes, if I fall on my face, if I sin, if my enemies are many, and if the devil runs around roaring, whatever may happen, Christ is alive and he will deliver us. Christ is alive and he will intervene. But if I say, no, it's all over, there's no God and I have no hope, well, I start from sorrow again. But this is a bypass. You slip away. You go this way and you come in front again. You take a shortcut. Let's take a shortcut, brethren, for the blessing of God. Let's not continue in our own ways, but always follow the footsteps of Christ that lead us to His heavenly Father and blessed Father. Here there is truly a problem that has no hope. Nebuchadnezzar, the, wor the world leader, has seen a dream. He is the supreme authority on the face of the earth who says, and it's done, who commands, and they're put to death. He exalts and puts to humility. And it troubled him so much, as we said last Monday, that it was impossible for him to come to ease. So he sent out a commandment to all magicians, soothsayers, wise men, the philosophers, the rulers, and he told them, whoever reveals to me the dream and the interpretation, I will exalt him and praise him. But if you do not reveal it to me, I will put all of you to death. Don't tell me that there is another situation which is more despairing than this. One by one, they were all put to death and Arioch, the captain of the guard, the general of Nebuchadnezzar, went out and started killing and he reached Daniel. Daniel didn't run. He didn't say, my God, you have forsaken me. This is hope, dear brethren. He said, stop. Stop. Why are you killing? Stop killing. I will tell the interpretation. Are you, is he crazy? He isn't crazy. Is he faithful? I don't know how faithful he is with all his heart. But one thing I do know, that he hopes that God is alive and that God can do everything. Do you know this? Do you hope that Christ is alive and he can do everything? And indeed, he can do not only everything, but a lot, a lot more than what you can imagine, think, or ask for. But when? According to the power that works in us by the Holy Spirit. And I have come into such situations that I can't even pray. I look at the corner of prayer and I can't go. I can't stand it. I can't go and pray. I want to go and sleep. The only thing I want to do is sleep so I can forget. People say, I'm going to drink. We don't drink. Hallelujah. We thank God. But dear brethren, it's not right. Go to prayer as you are. Kneel. And if indeed God has baptized you in the Holy Spirit, then praise God. Do you hope that God will fill you in the Holy Spirit? Say, Christ, will you come? At that moment, he will meet with you. At that moment, Daniel said, stop. I don't know how many of us would have been terrified and we still would be running. But what is this that you're asking? But we thank God, dear brethren, because under any circumstance, Daniel knows that there is his Lord whom he worships, he loves, and he praises. Under any circumstance and for any event. And he knows that he will do the best. Blessed is he who hopes in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. He will be always like a tree that is planted by the channels of water. The scourging of the sun will come and won't touch him. 
Misery will come. It won't come to him. Why? Because he hopes in God. And this characteristic of hope makes him a tree, not any type of tree, any tree. Because if a scourging comes, every tree goes dry. If disaster comes, everyone cries. But he will be different. And you know, dear brethren, there is a nice trait that Christ has with his people. He makes an exception. Whatever happens around us doesn't happen to you because you hope in Christ. The same things don't happen to you. Affliction, disaster, misery, all the curses of God on the Pharaoh except of the land of Gesen. Why? Because they hoped in the Lord. And now that all these bad things are coming on humanity, with us the Lord, He will always make an exception. And we thank God for that. Blessed exception. So Daniel, when he saw the difficulty, he called Meshach, Sadrach, and Abednego and told them, they are getting ready to kill us all. Let us go pray, because only God can save us. And may we hear this, my brethren. Only God can save you. Don't think that you can be saved on your own, my brother or sister. Your education, your ability can't save you. Your strength, your smartness, your deposits, your wealth, your business. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, says the Word of God. But it doesn't end there. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And who are the ones who seek the Lord? The ones who hope in Him. If you don't hope, how will you go seek Him out? If you do not hope that you will find Him, if you do not hope that He will hear you, if you do not hope that He will answer you, how will you go seek Him? The ones who hope in the Lord, the ones who seek the Lord, do not lack any good thing. And so I can add something and end with this matter. Uh, but dear brethren, I assure you, this matter is the special matter for us today. What did David say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not need. It's over. How do you know it? I don't have to explain it to you. It's sure in my heart that the Lord is my shepherd. And the question is, is the Lord your shepherd? Are you a sheep of the flock of Christ? Have you made the decision, in other words, for Him to lead you always, even through difficult ways, paths of righteousness? Do you trust that wherever He will lead you, in the end, He will bring you to green pastures and restful waters? Or will you say, where is He going this way? Up on the rocket rocks. Don't look at the rocks. Look behind the rocks, what God has prepared for you. Because if you don't go through the rocks, you will never reach the valley, the blessed valley. You will never reach it. But through the rocks, walk, follow Christ. And can I tell you something? Whatever comes into our life, let us walk it. Let us not fear it, walk it. The Lord brought it before you, unless you chose it on your own. If you stretched out your arm and chose it on your own, then see that you may pray again so God can correct your way. Because the truth is that in our life, we make mistakes. We make mistakes. And... Can I tell you something? We pay for our mistakes. And what are mistakes? God tells us, go this way and we go that way. Or, we start without asking God. Or, we act without at least praying and saying, not asking, but saying, Lord, please close the, re the way if it isn't yours. I remember when I changed jobs, it was a period when I changed jobs, it was a period in 1989. In front of me I had three or four jobs, which were very good. But it was when I had first been baptized in the Holy Spirit and I had learned that the Lord must be my shepherd. And even though in human terms I had to be glad and rejoice and jump in glee for all these jobs that had opened before me, I went and prayed and said, Lord, please, close all the doors that aren't from you and leave one door that you have appointed for me. But I said this in honesty. Once, two, three, four, five times, I don't know. 
and by miracle, from all the jobs, all shut, except the one that I didn't want to go to. The one that I didn't want, the Lord left for me. Egyo. And I went to Egyo. I left a very good job here in close to my house, my neighborhood. I left church. I had first believed then, and I went to Egyo. To Egyo, it was a job that was then wretched. A factory that was filled with snakes, and there were about 15 people who were working in there who paid no attention to anyone. I was so sad. I cried so much. I shed so many tears. The first time I went down to Egyo, I said, the guy who had the factory was driving me down. And as I went down, I said, it's your fault, I told God. When I came to church, I was well, and look how you made me now. Listen to what I was saying. But it was my, I had such great sorrow in my heart. I do not want to say more, but when I left, I didn't want to go. He kept me there for three and a half years. In these three and a half years, what can I say? God did marvels. He taught me His Word. He baptized me in the Holy Spirit. He taught me how to preach. Spiritual things and many other things. He baptized my family in the Holy Spirit. He kept my children in Christ. He raised them in His church. He united us with my wife even more. The spiritual things and a lot more things I could tell you. But also material. Everyone was hungry at work. Everyone had afflictions at work. But God had sent me a crow. If you don't believe me, ask Anna and the Lord. There was this accountant who, I don't know how he managed, but then the company was in a very difficult situation. And everyone was paid late. The only one who was paid on time and fully was me from this accountant, this crow. He'd go get the money and say, here, Mr. Gorovesis, have the money. It was the period when I had to be in great difficulty and I was in prosperity then. When I left there, the church of Egyo had been established. I had met many good brethren. The Lord had blessed me. And when it, when it was for me to leave, I didn't want to leave. I don't want to leave, Lord. He pulled me out. Again, I was crying when I left there. And I came here. But dear brethren, instead of going with tears where God has prepared for us His blessing, isn't it nice, my dear brethren, to trust Christ? Why should you go through affliction? Through trial. So you can have, so God can teach you patience. Go on, my brother, as God leads you. Only be sure that this is by God. I still thank God for those years in Egyo, and not only I, but all my family also. It was, they were very beautiful years. But the next years were even more beautiful. And the next years will be even more beautiful. Because this is the characteristic of the Church of Christ, dear brethren. We don't go from bad to worse. But we go always in our life from better to better with one condition. And please permit me once again to point it out that this is by God. One condition. Your hope must be in Christ. And your hope must be Christ. It's not a difficult thing. It's not one of the great, powerful, and many of the things that God wants. He wants other great things also. He wants devotion. He wants... These are the easy things. And blessing is the easy thing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without, of course, us forgetting trials, which are, as we said, for training, which are, as we said, for fruit. The best example for fruit-bearing of trial is Christ. He went up on the cross so He can save all of us. There wasn't any other way, and if there isn't another way for you to save your family, then God will take you through this trial. But say Amen, because this trial that has the result, the salvation of your family, works for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory in heaven. Why should we not accept to be afflicted lightly, just for a moment, so we can enjoy in heaven eternal weight of glory, of salvation, and indeed of the people that we love? or the people who we do not love, but the Lord will make us love them, and our enemies even. Hallelujah. Of course, God did not disappoint Daniel, neither the, his three companions. Very quickly, he revealed to them, he revealed to Daniel through a night vision, 
the dream and interpretation of the dream, which is amazing and for which we will speak about today. Because it wasn't a simple dream. It was a word of God what was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar that night. And look here how from one single event, how many things God does. Through one dream, first of all, He will exalt Daniel. Secondly, He will bless Nebuchadnezzar. And He will bring us also so we can know that everything is in the hands of God. Things don't happen because of our power or the abilities of man. And he shows him a nice dream to Nebuchadnezzar that they reveals to Daniel also. And Daniel goes in and says, I will tell you. Ariok lost it and he ran quickly into the king and says, One of the Jews of the people of Israel told me that they will tell you the dream and the interpretation. Bring him in. Can you tell me the dream and interpretation of the dream? And Daniel answered and said, I can't tell you the dream and interpretation. And no man can tell you the dream and interpretation. But what I can tell you is that there is a God who reveals everything. Hallelujah. Do we know this? Do you know that there is a God who reveals everything? That anything you may ask for Him, He will answer. He will explain to you. Just as long as your hope is in Christ, and hope only in Christ. I'll, tell, I'll say this until we end. Our hope must be Christ. There is a God who knows everything and reveals things. But be careful, he says, Nebuchadnezzar. Do not think that he revealed this to me because I am the better, the best man of all and I am the most blessed, the most holy, the most important. But this was revealed to me by God so you can know the thoughts of your heart and he reveals to you God himself the future all the whole future of the humankind and it's amazing dear brethren in just one dream which will become a word of God as it became also and we read it God revealed the history of all humankind and he created so you cannot say he revealed first he created and then he revealed. From Abraham, he created the people of God. From Nebuchadnezzar, he will create the empires of men. You saw an image that was excellent. It was great. It was splen it splendid. It was excellent. It stood before you and its form was awesome. This is your dream. And just imagine the amazement of Nebuchadnezzar with this revelation. And he says, this image's head was of fine gold. Its head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms of the image were of silver. Its belly and thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. And its feet par partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you watched this image and were admiring this, a stone was cut out without hands, without using hands. No one intervened. No human hand pulled this stone out of the mountain. This stone fell and struck the image on its feet, which were of iron and clay, of iron and clay, and the iron, and the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. They became nothing, like chaff from a summer threshing floors. So the wind carried them away, and no trace of them was found. And that stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Hallelujah. A dream that's amazing. But also, the interpretation, my dear brethren, is only, there's no other interpretation, only by the Holy Spirit. No one can interpret this dream. No one can explain it. There is an image, the head is gold, the chest and the arms are of silver, further down it's bronze, bronze further down it's iron, and then iron and clay. Now, look how easy for us it is to understand it and how difficult it was for Nebuchadnezzar to understand it. It's easy for us to understand it because 
these things have happened. We have come to the end. He says, you, my king, are the golden head. You and your kingdom. But after you, another kingdom will, ri will arise which be inferior to yours, which is of silver, and these are the Medians and Persians. And we know the history. And everyone knows this story. But this event took place many years before it actually took, came to pass, before this dream was brought out. In the beginning, with the empire and the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. After this second empire, the third empire will come, and for the third, it says that it's then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. The Medians and Persians did not, did not rule over all the earth. The third will rule over all the earth, and this is Greece, Alexander the Great. In 13 years, he conquered the whole world. From 20 years old until 33, was it his ability? And we must be careful of our thoughts here, brethren. Was he so able? Was Alexander so able? He didn't have abilities. God had programmed this to happen. Let us not admire Alexander, but admire him only because he was a chosen vessel of God without him knowing it. Even more, if you read about the history of the church, when Alexander the Great reached Jerusalem, the high priest came out of the temple along with the Levites and the priests and they met him as the prophesied conqueror of the scriptures. And Alexander the Great confessed that when he was, before he started his expedition, he saw a vision. And this vision was that he was to go through Jerusalem and there the high priest and the priests would greet him. What exactly happened? And indeed, he also had a message, the high priest, for him by God. And he told him, God is with you and you will conquer the whole world. This, this was the message by God. And he took courage and continued. It's amazing, dear brethren. It's not that Nebuchadnezzar was great. God gives authority of greatness. There's no man who is great. Only God gives, gives powers. And indeed, look, let's see now how Daniel speaks in his interpretations, what words he uses. And he says, You, O king, are a king of kings. Why? For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. It's not that we must look to the ability of men. It is that sufficiency is given by the Lord so everyone can do the work that God has appointed him to do. After Nebuchadnezzar, we said it was the Medians and the Persians, then were the Greeks, the Greeks who with Alexander the Great, and the scripture says here that he shall rule over all the earth, and I told you that the his I made a mistake. No, it wasn't the church history. It was in a study in a big book about Alexander the Great, which is a historical book, and it refers to different events in his life. And it's very interesting, and I read it, and I read it again and again, when it spoke about the entrance of Alexander the Great in Jerusalem, and his testimony about the vision, and the testimony of the priest that, fear not, God has given you authority so you can conquer the whole world. And history didn't write why he said this, but we know why he said this because the priest read it in Daniel. And after the, the empire of the Greeks, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, and this is the Roman Empire, and it was truly powerful as iron, and inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. 
tremendous empire. It was very harsh. Alexander the Great, though, at least that is how he presented himself, as a redeemer, as a deliverer. He didn't go as a conqueror. That's why wherever he went, the armies followed him. He brought freedom to the land. He went in and said, I free you from the tyrants. Was it his policy, his way of thought? I do not know, I do not want to judge, nor do I want to extol Alexander the Great because he is a Greek. But what we want to say is that God gives authority to man. All governing authorities are given by God, are appointed by God. For that reason, we must be subject to the governing authorities. Of course, there are also situations where God permits, and they're not by God, they're by Satan, like the Antichrist. He, this is not an authority by God, but God permits it. And what will the result be for God to permit the Antichrist to reign for seven years on humanity? A great multitude will be saved. As many weren't saved with the preaching of the gospel, with the rapture of the church, so many will be saved in the seven-year period of the Antichrist. And first of all, the people of Israel. With the preaching, the people of Israel cannot be saved. With the Antichrist, they will be saved. But it's not only the people of Israel who will be saved, but a great multitude cannot be numbered from all nations, from all peoples, will be the ones who will not put on the mark, finally, the 666 number, and they will not worship the image of the Antichrist. Immediately, it says, not immediately, but after the Roman Empire, we will see this, Whereas you saw the feet and the toes after the Roman Empire, after the legs, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. And here is the European Union. You know, there, brethren, that we haven't had a common currency since the Roman Empire in Europe. Just as the scripture says. In the Roman Empire, they had one currency, Caesar's money. Jesus said, show me the denarii of Caesar. Whose inscription is on it? Caesar's. In what language is it written? Roman. So he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. The first time that a common currency is created after 2,000 years approximately is now. It's this, it's this time now. And see how nicely he describes it here. It's an amazing description. European Union. So we cannot think that it wasn't the Gaul who did this. I don't know who started it. But the Lord started this. Here what it says. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. It will have strength, great strength and it will have harshness. And the truth is that it, you can discern this. There go all human rights, everything. It will become a very hard kingdom. The Antichrist hasn't come yet. It is the empire, it is the great nation of the European Union that everyone, they don't conquer them, but everyone wants to get in this union. It doesn't increase with wars. This is a miracle. That is why it's divided. It's not a ruler at the European Union, but all nations, in an amazing way, everyone wants to enter the European Union. And now that the social governments have been destroyed, now all Europe, the Bulgarians, Romanians, everyone, their hope is to come under the European Union, and they will enter it, as many as God will permit, until the point of the end, when this empire, we'll see later on, will cover all the face of the earth with the Antichrist. Let's continue now. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly, the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. They will never become the United States of Europe. They will always be the English, the French, the Greeks, the Spaniards. They don't have the time to do this, to be united like the United States had the time.
because the United States started out like this, but not exactly. They had immigrants, they had pilgrims, they had slaves. They went and they became one nation, but the European Union would not become one nation. For that reason, they're trying to make a chamber. Who's going to rule Europe? Germans? The French? They don't say that we will all rule together because we can't. But they are trying to gain authority. Who will be the president? They dare not say who the president will be. If it will be a German, the French and the Italian will be complaining. If it will be Italian, the British and the Germans and the French will be complaining. One will be complaining about the other. They can't make a president. But we know that the president will come and he will be the Antichrist. He will probably be from Greek. But why will the Antichrist be a Greek? It's not because we say this. Neither because we boast in this. Neither do we say, you see how important we are, the Antichrist is Greek. No. But this is specific. The Antichrist, as we'll see later on in Daniel, is first of all one of the descendants, a nation of the descendants of Alexander the Great. And the descendants, who were the descendants of Alexander the Great? When Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided in four parts. It was divided in Egypt, with Ptolemaeus, Syria with Antioch, then it was Asia with, I do not remember his name, with Seleucus, and then the other was Macedonia, Greece, with the people of Alexander, the actual descendants of Alexander. So he must be one of, from one of these four, the Antichrist comes from one of these four descendants. And at the same time, he must be from a nation of Europe. These four descendants have nothing to do with Europe. Egypt can't ever become a part of the European Union. Neither will Turkey ever become. Don't see this. She will not have time to enter Turkey. And Syria also will never enter the only country that is at the same time one of the four descendants of Alexander the Great when his kingdom was divided and at the same time a part of the European Union is Greece. So for that reason we don't boast but apparently from what we presume through the scripture the Antichrist will be Greek. Don't search to find him, you'll never find him because it's a mystery, it cannot be revealed. Only when the rapture of the church occurs will the Antichrist be revealed. It says this. Remember where it says it. You want us to read this so we can remember since we are referring to this. It says in the second epistle of Apostle Paul toward Thessalonians second chapter, Now brethren, concerning this, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together of him, the rapture of the church, and I read from the second chapter in the fifth verse now, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. You know what is that which is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed. He is the one who possesses, the scripture says, and it is the Holy Spirit, it's the Church of Christ. He cannot be revealed, the Antichrist, within humanity wherein at the same time the Church of Christ exists. Because it's written that he who dwells inside us is greater than the one who dwells in the world. And when the Antichrist will be revealed, will have, he will have all authority. The devil will have given him all authority. So the Antichrist cannot coexist with the Church. I repeat this. I read it again. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. And it says later on, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This mystery is already at work. The work of the Antichrist is already operating. And it will continue until he who now restrains is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Until the restrainer is taken out of the way, immediately after the lawless one will be revealed. This is a mystery. It cannot be revealed. It's impossible for it to be revealed, and for that reason, the people and the day of the rapture of the church will be eating, drinking, building, giving into marriage, getting married. They will be in a prosperity, all humanity. And what does the word of God encourage us to do? Be careful from cares of this, of this world. 
What kind of care for this world should we, ca should we have when the Antichrist comes? Then there will be the mark, then there will be terror and persecution. But the main characteristic is that the one who dwells inside us always will be greater than the one who dwells in the world. When the rapture of the church will take place, then the Antichrist will receive all authority. The Antichrist will have all authority. And now, dear brethren, we must be careful of something since the word of God brought it to this point. Will the Holy Spirit exist in the seven year period of the Antichrist? There will be no Holy Spirit. And how will the two prophets prophesy? There will be, but it will be the Holy Spirit of the Old Testament, as Jeremiah prophesied, Isaiah prophesied. What will there not be? The grace of Christ. There will not be this, whoever calls upon the name of Christ shall be saved. The grace of Christ will not exist. The heavens will close. Because the ruler of this world will be almighty, and he will give to the Antichrist all his authority. And it will be the continuance, and let's see this also, the continuance of the European Union. But there will not be another empire after this. The European Union will reveal itself as the kingdom of the Antichrist. That is where he will reign, and from there he will prevail on the whole world. There is where he will bring out all his rage. The first three and a half years he will be noble. He will encourage people to put on the mark. And he will give also offerings. He will, the people will prosper in his kingdom that will go with him. But the second three and a half years, when the abomination of desolation sits in the temple of God, as a God, from there on he will reveal his harsh features. That is when the people of Israel will believe, when they will be crying out, do not put on the mark of the beast, and the two antichrists who will be put to death but will be risen, this is an amazing miracle, the whole world will see them being risen, and the last three and a half years as I read it, there will be a great tribulation that never took place before. What this tribulation will be, because persecution has taken place. Everything has taken place. Christians have been cast to the lions. Amazing persecutions have taken place. But what persecutions will happen then? What will this man do that there will be such a trial and tribulation that has never come and will never come again? And if God didn't shorten those days, no one will be left alive. My dear brethren, we must be careful to leave with the rapture of the church. May God keep us safe. Because Christ did not appoint His church so He can be beaten, so He can be afflicted, so He can be persecuted. Because Christ will present a church that is holy, clean, and glorious. The scripture says the gospel, this gospel will be preached to the whole world and afterward the end will come. We now what we are expecting is the preaching of the gospel and the rapture of the church and the preaching of the gospel as God wants it with the powers of the Holy Spirit. Be careful, we're not waiting for afflictions by the Antichrist. We are expecting blessings of God. The devil is defeated. He cannot touch the church. Those who have been born again, the devil can't even touch them. He can't just afflict them. He can't even touch them. He can't touch us. Because the church of Christ is in triumph. She will leave triumphantly for heaven. She won't leave beaten and smolden. She won't go to the wedding of a lamb with tussled hair and afflicted. May God keep us, brethren. The danger, our danger is cares of this world. The deceit of wealth. Well-being. We do not wait for wars now. Wars will come after the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, then we will do all these things later on with the grace of God, God willingly. If you remember, then are the seals that start, who will open the book, and then the second seal is war. The first is the preaching of the gospel, the word of God, but of the Old Testament with the two prophets. That is where it starts from. And then it's wars, hunger, Great affliction. We now wait for the glorious Christ. We are waiting for the glory of the church. But the rapture of the church will come when we do not expect it. 
we don't say it delays because we're lost. We're saying the Lord is coming quickly. And for Christ to be praised, not, not much time and not many things are needed. This is the last empire. And then it's over. After that, a stone, a small stone. You know, this is the Church of Christ, the Word of God. A small stone from the mountain will fall and strike the feet of the Antichrist, the second coming. And nothing will be left standing. There goes humanity. Jesus Christ will come down with all his saints and he will establish the kingdom, the last kingdom. See how he says this now. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now we are in the European Union. Now we are expecting for the rapture of the church, and immediately after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist will be revealed. And then the last empire will come of the Antichrist and will reign for seven years and God will shorten the time and will become less than seven years, about six and a half years. How many days does it say? Evening, mornings, it says less than seven years, six and a half. I do not really know. I do not remember the number right now. And after that, you know, how the world will be when the second coming will come. There will be great tribulation. The powers of heaven will have shifted and they will see the sign of the Son of Man and people will despair from the things that are about to come. They will tremble from the things that are happening. Nuclear war, a great earthquake that will throw down all the cities of the earth. A tremendous thing. May God keep us, dear brethren, so we can leave gloriously with the rapture of the church. May God protect us. And how nicely that with this dream, God made a miracle, and he did this with Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, and he exalted Daniel with this. And Daniel became a ruler in the Chaldeans, so that the Israeli people did not have the affliction of the slaves, and they were blessed. It is amazing how the work of God covers everything, everything. And the work of God will be done in your life, and God will defend you, and God will help you, and He will increase you, and He will bless you, and He will do everything in your life with one condition. Your hope must be in Christ. And do not trust anyone, only Christ. Trust no one. Jesus Christ is the one and only who can save you, He can help you, He can bless you, He can protect you, He can lead you, and in the end He can come and receive you. Amen.